Hello, good morning and welcome. I'm Bob Rogers, Executive Director of Coastside Land Trust. I would like to welcome all of you to the Coastside Land Trust's this edition of the Coastside Land Trust free community webinar series. The Coastside Land Trust is dedicated to the preservation, protection, and enhancement of the open space environment, including the natural, scenic, recreational, historical, and agricultural resources of Half Moon Bay and the San Mateo County Coast for present and future generations. We are a nonprofit organization working hard since 1997 to safeguard our scenic bluffs, open space, stream corridors, and agricultural lands. From the southern city limits of Half Moon Bay north through the community of Montera in San Mateo County. Taking a strategic approach to land conservation, we protect land by purchasing and accepting donations of land and conservation easements. We secure private and public funding for land conservation. We provide assistance and resources to landowners interested in protecting their land. And we lead conservation, restoration, stewardship, and educational activities. And every day we remain dedicated to protecting our coast side and our future. As members of our community and valued Coastside Land Trust supporters, we ask you to make choices that support our organization and our important work. This can be done by donating through our website. Other easy ways to donate are through planned giving of assets and land through wills and living trusts, vehicle donation, gifts of stock or tribute gifts, also showing up for our work days and passing along our message and our mission. The important part here is that we are all do our part in whatever way we can to help protect and steward our shared open spaces. Thank you for joining us today. And it's now my pleasure to turn it over to Kate Dickey, our social media coordinator to introduce our presenter. Take it away, Kate. Thank you so much, Bob, and welcome to Mark Hilkema. Um, we're really excited to be hosting this free web community webinar with Mark today, as he's gonna be sharing about, sharing about the fascinating history of the Pigeon Point Lighthouse and Franklin Point and what's you know the led to the construction of that. Um, also, the history is, Mark asked us to, to be brief in a description of him, but there's, he's, it's, we're really, really grateful to have him here. He is a supervisor of the Cultural Resources Program for California State Parks for um, 32 park units. He's an archaeologist with 44 years of experience throughout the state, um, teaching anthropology at Foothills College, UC Santa Cruz, Santa Clara University, Ohlone College, and Cabrillo College. Um, he served as pre president for the Society of Archaeology for California in 2015 and 2016, and has con contributed just a great deal to the regional archaeology um, and the, the literature here that, that has been used and, and continues to be um, a resource for our state. A um, couple of ground rules before we get started is that um, during this presentation, we'll just ask that you type your questions into the Q&A section. That section will be um, where we, uh, we'll be looking, we'll be answering questions at the follow-up um, session at the end of the webinar. So please type those into the Q&A section. We'll make sure we answer as many as we can. Um, also, there will be a follow-up email that will come to you a couple days after this presentation. We will be recording this video um, and sharing that with you. There'll be, I think if there's additional resources that um, our presenter will be sharing, we'll, we'll put those there as well. And then we'll just ask, you know, if you, if you find this to be particularly interesting, you're learning a lot to just share that with, with folks also to spread the word this, um, hopefully as a gift to you and, and something that you kind of pass on. Um, also, if, you know, there are a, a million different places to donate, um, but we ask that you really consider that we have upcoming um, Coastside Gives, but also just when you're making your decisions about donation to really consider the Coastside Land Trust and and for a number of reasons. I mean, we all have to kind of decide what works, what aligns with our values, but for the land preservation, certainly for the, the program that we're running with the Cabrillo Unified School District with the Junior Land Stewards, this webinar program where we hope that we're really connecting you with learning and orienting you to the 
to where you live and the natural environment and the history and archaeology of this environment. So um, just ask that you kind of keep that in your in your your scope as we're moving ahead. So anyway, without further ado, um, I introduce Mark Hilkema. Well, hello, everybody. And I'm glad you're able to attend the session. First thing I want to say is I never set myself up to be an entertainer. Um, but I like to tell stories. And so this is a story that is particular, particularly dear to me. Um, it isn't often as an archaeologist that we find, you know, um, the archaeology that comes with a actual written background as well. Um, in this talk, I want to speak specifically about um, a little maritime history of the peninsula and Bay Area, a little timeline. Uh, starting with Native American culture here, and then go into the uh, gold rush period and what that meant for uh, the development of the area. And then I want to go into the specifics of three particular shipwrecks that occurred within three years of each other with significant loss of life that ultimately led to the construction of the Pigeon Point Lighthouse in 1871. That lighthouse served to protect mariners um, after these three uh, particular, particularly tragic shipwrecks. Um, and so as an archaeologist, when I joined state parks, um, I didn't anticipate that I would have to deal with maritime disasters as part of my routine uh, amongst our coastal parks. But that's indeed what I had to do. And so I'm going to talk about the archaeological recovery of some of the shipwreck remains that were being exposed uh, from the sailors that were exposed during erosion of Franklin Point, where the wrecks uh, occurred, uh, just below Pigeon Point. And then I'm going to talk about um, uh, the results of the archaeological uh, recovery and how we worked to stabilize the site after that. Um, because ultimately, um, we did reinter the skeletal remains that had been recovered as an ethical consideration, a part of our human um, story in life is our follow through at end of life. And having worked with Native Americans for many, many years, I've learned to, um, so it always happens when you're doing stuff, I've learned to um, honor, you know, how to treat with the ancestral remains. And so that's part of my effort now is to um, talk to you about our efforts to uh, rebury the remains. So uh, I'm sorry for that. I have a fax machine here and I don't know how to shut it off. So it's just gonna ring for a little bit. There it goes. That's typical of broadcasts. So um, starting, um, let me go on and uh, get the show going here. The area we're talking about is Annie Nuevo State Park in Pigeon Point. And it's a projection of land that sticks out into the ocean into the Pacific separating the Northern Monterey Bay from the San Francisco Inlet and um, Gulf of the Farallons. And at Annie Nueva, we have four prominent points of land that figured in the maritime history. Balsa Point, Pigeon Point, where the lighthouse is, Franklin Point, which became a shipwrecked sailor cemetery, and uh, Point Annie Nueva itself. So that gives you a geographic bearing of where we are. In California's maritime history, um, and, and I use the word history to talk about the advent of written culture as opposed to prehistory, um, the time before written culture uh, or written histories. Um, at the time of the first European explorations of the coast, um, it was a very unknown region. Um, Spain had conquered uh, the Aztec Empire in 1522, began uh, spreading outward from Mexico City and inadvertently stumbled on the Pacific Ocean, hard to imagine, um, and then began to explore the Pacific from there. And setting sail, um, they began to create an economic network and a travel route to Asia and move materials back and forth from Asia to Mexico and then to Europe. Um, in the process of learning the trade winds and currents and sailing routes, many of these ships would uh, find themselves off the California coast um, before they had to set sail southward and uh, to Acapulco and San Blas, Mexico, where they would unload their cargo. It was a, a, a danger fraught journey. Many of the sailors would die of scurvy and uh, disease. Um, and so Spain was motivated to look for a port 
somewhere north of Mexico where these ships could stop, resupply themselves with fresh water, uh, green foods, and continue their voyage. In 1542, um, Cabrillo sails uh, northward uh, under orders to look for a harbor. He finds the Channel Islands, which is occupied by thousands and thousands of Chumash native people. Um, and then he continues northward with a broken arm that he gained by slipping on the rocks um, on one of the islands in Santa Barbara. That would later kill him on the voyage with gangrene. Um, but they sailed past um, a point of land in a harbor they named the Bay of the Pine Trees and a point of land they named Point Lobos, uh, the, the sea wolves, because um, they could hear the barking of sea lions out there, um, and continued northward and sailed uh, up the California coast. But during their voyage, they did not notice the entrance to San Francisco Bay. So the bay itself continued to be an unknown feature to Europeans for quite a while thereafter. Um, 1579, um, uh, a mariner named Sermenio wrecks his galleon near Tamales Bay, makes the voyage south in a small boat. Uh, that same year, uh, a little thereafter, um, uh, a British mariner named uh, Sir Francis Drake also harbors himself somewhere uh, near Point Reyes, possibly. We, we're still debating the actual location and um, tries to take the Manila Galleon, which he does. Um, and these become some of the first, you know, encounters with the California coast for Europeans. Um, in 1602, Sebastian Vizcaino, a mariner who was ordered to follow up on Cabrillo's journeys, finally lands at a harbor, the Bay, the Bay of the Pines, and renames it Monterey after the Viceroy of Mexico, and is the first to anchor his vessel and is greeted by the native people of Monterey, who provide food and supplies to them, and we see a very uh, positive uh, meeting at that time. Vizcano continues on his journey, but he tells um, in his diary that Monterey was a fabulous harbor, uh, big enough to hold the imperial fleet of Spain, he writes, which of course is bragging a little bit because it is a very exposed harbor for sailing ships. But it did spur the desire to explore, but then nothing happens for 167 years. Um, the coast is ignored um, until Russians begin to express uh, interest with their fur traders in Alaska um, who are looking for a place to settle and create a vegetable garden. Later that would happen and that is now known as Fort Ross um, above um, Bodega Bay. In any case, Monterey was uh, founded and, uh, or at least visited, um, but still the coast was unknown. It wasn't until 1770, uh, after the land expedition in 1769 by Gaspar de Portola, um, that Spain decided it was time to actually colonize the upper California coast. And so they sent expeditions northward with that in mind. In their journeys, they encountered large numbers of Native American people. California had a very high population, uh, a very large population of Native people, uh, representing a wide diversity of languages and cultural backgrounds. In the San Francisco Bay Area, we find, find that there was a particularly cosmopolitan landscape with um, many, many different tribes. In fact, between Monterey and San Francisco, there were 50 independent uh, individual polities that we would call uh, tribes, much like uh, many counties, each with villages in between. During these visits to the Bay and the explorations that the Spanish uh, were making, they frequently talked about um, the boats on the Bay. Um, there are many native boats described made out of tule reeds, tule balsas that were tied together that are fairly buoyant, although they do get waterlogged. In this image, you see a watercolor done by a French artist named Louis Chari or Charis in 1816. Um, Mission San Francisco and the Presidio were built in 1776. So Chari is visiting the harbor. The French are actually uh, spying on the fortifications, but um, under the guise of uh, exploration of the Pacific. And in this image, Chari has painted um, several Ohlone men and a woman uh, paddling around off of Fort Point. Point to the left is Chrissy Fields or what will become Chrissy Fields. And we see that their boats are low in the water and double bladed, much like a kayak. And um, the accounts begin, begin to come in about these vessels. Um, I'm trying to write about that now. I see a relationship between the Thule balsas and the maritime trade and the many, many mounted sites along the Bay shore. 
This is a map of the political environment that the Spaniards encountered. All of these names represent tribal territories. Within those tribal territories are multitudes of villages. In 1904, um, there was a survey done by the new Department of Anthropology at Berkeley that mapped um, the numerous large mounds that they still could see around the Bay Shore. And some 425 of these monumental mounds were mapped, some as big as football fields and 60 feet high. I now believe that those mounds were ports for maritime travel uh, between the Bay people and the many tribes. So the Bay Area was a very cosmopolitan landscape then and now um, as people learned to navigate the Bay and recover many, many resources. Our talk will focus on the Caroste area of Año Nuevo, one of the more powerful tribes of the peninsula. When the Spanish um, begin exploring by land the bay, it's not until 1775 that the first ship uh, makes entrance, and that's the San Carlos. One of the great um, diarists on board is Father Vicente um, Santa Maria, and I love reading his diary of his encounters and their encounters with Native people for the first time. Um, and so we find that uh, many of the descriptions of the boats occur at, uh, from their encounters with their ship in the bay. Um, this is a view of Angel Island at Ayala Cove, named after the sailing master of the San Carlos. And what I like is this description of a visit uh, by a retinue of Native people um, paddling up to these ships, which is pretty amazing. They'd never seen them before. And about how the retinue of uh, Native people were decked out with feather work and painted and had many shell beads and ornaments. And what the Spaniards could not realize is that it was a visit um, by uh, the local authorities who want to check out who these guys are. Um, and what we get from this encounter is a very positive reaction. Uh, the Native people are amazed by the vessel. They enjoyed ringing the ship's bell quite a bit, as we read. Um, they were amazed by the ropes, some as thick as a man's leg. Um, they were very, very aware of cordage. Their world was one of fiber, cordage, and feather work. And so they um, truly appreciated the complexity of these vessels. Later accounts speak about um, the native vessels as well. And I'm trying to collect many of these accounts. They refer to them as balsas and describe seeing them along the shorelines uh, of the villages that they visited. Um, and they really admire the construction of these vessels. Um, and so they talk about them carrying up to four people, double-bladed paddles, um, and they um, kind of condescendingly admire them as though that they're surprised that Native people were making such complex uh, things. Um, they talk about them having arched, you know, uh, railings on the side in some cases, um, and that they were quite fast when rode um, kay kayak st uh, style, that they were actually quicker than the longboats that the Spaniards were using to map out the bay. And so they also talk about some of them having anchors made of stone. These were round uh, bowling ball sized stones that were held in nets thrown overboard to anchor the vessels so they could fish. Um, and so they talk quite a bit about finding stakes and traps located all around the bay, um, which further you know, speaks to the maritime capabilities of the local people. They're harvesting resources from the bay, as well as trading between villages across the bay. Um, and we get these great accounts of fishing with nets and uh, grabbing up the, the salmon and so forth. You have to remember in the day, the salmon run through the bay was enormous. It fed all of the interior Sierra Nevada streams, uh, many of the coast range, both south and north coast range streams that could uh, support salmon. So the amount of protein coming through these streams was ginormous, uh, which fueled some of the large settlements and population densities of the Bay Area. Um, we have one account of these boats out on the ocean. They are not um, ocean going vessels. They need sheltered waters. And this account is very interesting by Governor Fajes in 1775, says the Indians at Año Nuevo are very clever at going out to, fi out to sea to fish and barks on rafts of reeds. Uh, and they succeed in good weather in getting their provisions from the sea. So that's very interesting to me in terms of the maritime history of the coast. You could only launch a boat like that in very still waters 
in sheltered coves. Over a period of 50 years, Spain colonized the coast of California and established 21 Francisca, Franciscan missions, seven of which are in the Ohlone territory, which speaks to the density of people because they built the missions where the greatest native population densities were. And that goal was to, um, the reason for that was to convert the native people into citizens of Spain by hook or by crook, and then turn them into the labor force uh, for the imperial um, ambitions. And so we see the establishment of three institutions, the civilian pueblos, the military presidios where law and justice is dispensed, and the missions themselves, which drew the native people in to convert them into citizens. Unfortunately, disease in the missions wiped out about 95% of the indigenous population uh, pretty rapidly. Um, their survivors are with us still, so I want to add that the descendants of the Ohlone people of this area are still around, and I work with them very closely whenever I can. So one thing about Spain is they closed their ports to foreign trade. They were very paranoid about other peoples coming in and claiming space because it was a fairly undefended uh, region. Um, with the advent of the Mexican Revolution in the Mexican Republic after 1822, uh, Mexico did open California's post, uh, ports to trade, which uh, facilitated um, a lot of visitations by American and British ships as they sought to collect many of the cattle hides. The cattle roamed freely over the landscape in those days, and uh, the money was in the leather from the hides and the fat from the bones, the hide and tallow trade. And so we see more and more um, European visitors and American visitors coming in, one of whom... Um, was a Swiss immigrant named John Sutter who establishes a fort in what is now Sacramento and sets himself up just prior to the gold rush, um, which turns the world upside down. It was a, um, a fellow named John Marshall who he hired to build a sawmill in Sierra Foothills who first observed gold in the streams. And um, instead of keeping his mouth shut, he actually broadcast Eureka, I found gold as the saying goes, and the word gets out to the port of Monterey. And then from uh, this ship, the ships that visit Monterey, the word goes out to the world beyond that gold is available for the picking in California, which spurs a huge population influx into California. Um, many ships arrive into the port of Urba Buena, later San Francisco, uh, which was a bunch of sand dunes and plants and shacks, um, but soon became a thriving city as it became the gateway to the gold fields. Many uh, people flooded in. Uh, the population triples in a short time, and the people coming in are oftentimes uh, very desperate in uh, their goals and ambitions. And soon they seize all of the Mexican land holdings, and including, including Sutter's Fort, which you see in this picture, which is still standing as a state park in the center of downtown Sacramento. So this was a period of great difficulty for Native people as the gold rush spurred the extermination of many Native people, which was legally um, uh, illegal to do, and the selling of their children um, also occurred. And so um, the gold fields became the destination for many people arriving in California. To get here, there were two ways to do it. One was overland uh, through uh, very difficult terrains and meeting with many native tribes that were defending their territory, particularly in the Great Plains region, um, and then surviving the deserts and trying to reach California, a very precarious route. The other way was by sea. Um, and after statehood, we see the establishment of uh, many towns and cities um, and miners who were trying to rush to the gold fields and make their claims as soon as possible, oftentimes sailed from the East Coast to Panama uh, before the canal was built and would have to go overland through um, malaria-ridden swamps and wait on the opposite side of, you know, on the Pacific side to catch a ride all the way over to San Francisco. And there were just not enough ships. And so there was a very difficult time actually to reach um, the gold fields. Uh, <laughs> In the process, uh, a number of ships start to appear in the region, both for transport of people and materials. The thing about sailing ships is that they can't go wherever they want. They are dependent on the tides, the winds, and the seasons of the year 
Um, and these sailing ships don't generally uh, drive like a car, so they don't go in straight lines. They go at angles. The way a captain loads his cargo, the direction of the wind, the nature of the ship, um, all of this creates a complex algebraic formula for trying to find one's way to a port or destination. Um, and it often ends up in uh, tragedy as uh, mariners miscalculate their positions, and uh, which is indeed the case, that, as we will soon see. So the varieties of ships begin to become more diverse as people try and uh, arrive in the various destinations. One style of ship in particular, uh, the clipper ship, was designed for speed, uh, particularly by the British and the Americans as they sought to increase their travel time to Asia and to California. Clipper ships are flush deck, which means they don't have multiple layers of decks on them, and they are built uh, to be light and for speed. Um, the, the dynamics and physics of sailing ships is interesting to me. You need a lot of weight in the bottom of the hull to counteract the height of the masts and their top heaviness. Um, and a ship is like a beach ball. If you try and push a beach ball in a pool under the water, it wants to rise. And it's that downward thrust of the weight on the hull that forces it to want to come up and then move forward. So it's a complex process. Um, ships sailing across the vastness of the Pacific, um, trying to reach the port of San Francisco, found it quite challenging. They had to navigate around the risky Farallon Islands, which soon had a lighthouse built on it um, to help uh, protect ships from wrecking on the rocks there. Um, but it's a pretty narrow uh, passage to try and make uh, in through the Golden Gate, um, as you can see from this picture. So it became a very dangerous route. Um, the demand for uh, passengers and the gold rush and materials fueled all that and in turn led to a lot of maritime tragedies. This photo of San Francisco from 1856 tells a big story to me. Eight years before, this was all sand dune. And eight years later, look at what you see now. All of that material, all those windows, all the bricks, all the lime mortar mix, all the furnishings that go in these buildings, all has to come in and comes in rapidly by maritime transport. So um, you can see that the uh, San Francisco Maritime basically explodes in terms of uh, its busyness. And we also see the advent of the timber industry on the California coast. Um, this is when the redwood forests are being um, seen and uh, manipulated. And so we see quite a number of undertakings on the coast for logging and how to transport that wood uh, by, uh, by maritime travel um, increases. We also see increasing agriculture on the coast, particularly in Half Moon Bay and along those grassland terraces of that region. But the trick is how to get the materials to market. And I find it fascinating when you see some of the uh, attempts to uh, get a product to ships at sea uh, along this rocky cliff, uh, cliffy environment. This is one of my favorites. It's called up on top of this picture. It's called Gordon's Chute. It was built just above Tunitas Creek uh, below Half Moon Bay. And what you're looking at is quite a wooden contraption. Imagine the amount of timber and engineering that went into building this ramp where they would offload cargo down the ramp to a heaving deck that is moving up and down on a vessel. I can only wonder what it was like with the velocity of cargo going down this ramp when it hits the deck itself. It must have been pretty dangerous and colorful. Predictably, this contraption does not last. Storms take it out pretty quickly. Another example of coastal maritime um, challenges is the cabling that was rigged at Pigeon Point Lighthouse to also transport uh, material, particularly timber, to vessels offshore. Very risky business to do that. Up and down the coast, we see inlets that were uh, used for building these kinds of piers and such. This is a picture at Wilder Ranch State Park, where a number of iron rings still exist on the coastal rocks um, that once uh, were places for ships to tie off to to unload their cargo. Very, very dangerous. In Prohibition days, these are also the same coves where rum runner, runners would run their material and uh, spirits into um, onto the coast and take off with it. At Andy Nuevo, which projects way out at sea, we find that there are quite a number of maritime tragedies 
Um, I learned all this in my studies of these shipwrecks. And the three I want to talk about specifically are the Sir John Franklin wrecked in 1865, the Koya in 1866, and then the Hellespont in 1868. The Sir John Franklin was about um, 999 tons. It was a clipper ship, an American clipper ship outward bound from Rio de Janeiro, where it had stopped as its last port of call before uh, going south to tip of South America around the Cape and then over into the vastness of the Pacific. They had picked up a load of pianos and spirits, which I find interesting because San Francisco was quite the place in those days and continued its voyage across the Pacific as it approached the Farallon Islands and where they thought San Francisco would be, they entered thick fogs and were unable to secure their location through dead reckoning and um, the orientation of the sun on the horizon. They could not see the sun. It was an opaque blur. And unfortunately, uh, when they heard the breakers offshore, they realized they were too close. The ship does wreck and um, takes uh, quite a number of sailors down with it. Um, among the sailors was a 16-year-old uh, young man named Edward Church, and we know about him because Edward Church uh, was buried out on a point um, named after the vessel, the Sir John Franklin, along with many of his shipmates, and the captain and his shipmates drowned right there offshore, and uh, I have detailed accounts of these drownings from the survivors because a salvage court would follow the wreck of these ships as people take claim to whatever cargo might wash up. And in the court proceedings, we have the eyewitness accounts of the survivors, which are quite detailed and painful, I might add, um, and included in my archaeological report where I uh, paraphrase them in the report in depth. So Edward Church dies here when his mother found out about it. She was so bereaved that she uh, contracted the uh, placement of a marble cenotaph, uh, cenotaphs for maritime people, as opposed to um, other kinds of monuments. That monument lasted out on Franklin Point until the 1960s, until it was finally uh, stolen and never seen again. Just uh, about 22 months later, a second ship wrecks in the same way offshore of Pigeon Point. The Koya was a, a iron hull British built collier. It was carrying coal from Sydney, Australia to San Francisco when it too was offshore um, a little further south of, of the Golden Gate than they had thought. They also could not uh, get their position straight because of the fog. And it wrecks taking 26 of the 30 people uh, on board down. Very detailed accounts of the wreck, uh, very painful to read. As if that's not bad enough, within another year, a third ship wrecks. This is the Hellespont, an American-built ship, also out of Australia uh, from Sydney, uh, carrying a load of cargo <clears throat> of coal, as well as passengers. And it wrecks and uh, killing 10 people. In those days, um, sailing ships were not easy to manage. So when these captains soon learned that they were uh, coming close to land, they found themselves in a precarious position referred to as a leeward shore, which I'll talk about in a minute. But first, you have to understand the dynamics of sailing. These large sails of canvas are held out, um, held up by uh, masts and other parallel uh, structures called yard arms and are a complexity of ropes and pulleys that have to be turned as each uh, turn of the ship into the direction of the wind uh, determines where to set these sails. So life at sea is very dangerous. These sailors would have to scramble up these very tall masts, work their way out on the yard arms and unfurl and furl sails while the ship is heaving up and down. And the higher up on the mast you go, the greater the arc of the spiral of the mast. So it can be quite a roller coaster ride higher up. And so you wonder about the life at sea of these individuals. What, what must it have been like? Um, I'll throw some technical things in here. I'm gonna show you a diagram of a square rigged ship. Pay attention to the gray area in this diagram. It's just a little snippet of a much larger vessel. And it speaks to the complexity of sailing when you start looking at the orientation of ropes, pulleys, and what's involved with setting sails. If we go a little closer, um, you might appreciate thus the complexity of all of these pieces that have names known to the sailors themselves and um, 
so the idea of turning one of these sale sets into the appropriate wind direction gives you an idea of how complex that is. So these sailors, all three of these ships were locked into what's called a leeward shore. A leeward shore is um, a situation where the wind is driving towards an angle of a fixed land mass. And the ship finds itself drifting in that. As I said, they don't go straight, they go at diagonals. And if a sailing ship is not aware of its uh, proximity to a fixed land mass, they can find themselves in a situation where they can't get out. In other words, there's not enough sea room to turn the vessel around and back off of the shore. In this instance, when sailors understand the situation, they can know that their fate lies before them and it can take time for the situation to play out. And a uh, very unpleasant scenario, and this is what occurred with these three ships. So one choice a captain may have is to do something called wear ship. Wearing ship involves a process of setting sail and heading directly uh, towards the land as fast as you can, and then spinning the wheel, trying to turn your ship with the momentum it has gained um, and then arc it around into the uh, opposite side of the wind, then try and catch the wind in your sails and get momentum to sail away from the land. The risk to that is at one point, the ship is broadside to the wind and can lose all the wind on the sails. When you lose wind on the sails, the ship doesn't go the way you want it to go. And uh, that's called spilling the wind. Um, and spilling the wind puts you broadside to the breakers, and to a loss of wind and maneuverability and becomes a critical point, which is indeed what happened for these three ships where they broached. In other words, they're broadside to the waves, they hit rocks as they're fixed on the rocks, the torque of the wind on those maps, uh, on those masts can lever the ship apart. So it becomes important for the sailors to try and hack all of the rigging away with axes and hopefully have the masts go overboard to write the ship up, um, but that does not happen. In this case, they don't have time. And although they attempt it, um, the ships explode and everyone enters into the sea. And that's the result. This is not an actual photo of the ships in question, but it emphasizes my point. So after these three ships wrecked, I found an article by the San Mateo County Gazette, a newspaper writing uh, a very powerful column uh, to the feds about creating a lighthouse to prevent this unnecessary loss of life. And indeed that occurs. The federal government does step in and build Pigeon Point Lighthouse in 1871, along with its fog signal, where it stands today in serious need of repair. Although I retired from state parks a year ago, state parks is still um, trying to get secure some $14 million to manage this facility, which is aging out. So Franklin Point Shipwreck Cemetery, as it became known, remained forgotten for many, many years until coastal erosion caught up to it in pedestrian traffic. When I joined state parks, I was given this assignment of fixing it um, because we had human skeletal remains that were now eroding from what we soon learned was a shipwreck cemetery out at Franklin Point. I knew about that earlier, actually, when I was at San Jose State on my, as an undergraduate, um, <clears throat> we were called by state parks to recover some skeletal remains that some hikers had observed out on Franklin Point. And unfortunately, the hikers collected these bones and were soon featured in the San Francisco Chronicle, unaware that it is a felony to move may, uh, human remains as they may represent homicide victims or other crime scenes. So San Jose State was asked if we could go out um, by state parks to recover some of these remains and um, prevent the public from accessing them. When we went out to Franklin Point, a very windy peninsula sticking out in the open ocean, we qu quickly observed the problem was uh, rampant pedestrian traffic that was denuding the landscape of its vegetation, creating trails that soon um, eroded downward as the wind would blow away the sand, in the process exposing the coffins that had been buried in the 1860s. So here you see human remains uh, that these hikers found and were recovered by the coroner's office, um, thinking it was a homicide victim until we educated the coroner that indeed these were historic sailor remains and should remain in place. So those um, were entered uh, into 
a collection with state parks after a while where they remained for many years. San Jose State went out to the sandy point in the wind and we were able to recover four sets of skeletal remains in redwood coffins. You have to remember that the redwood forest was just being harvested at this time and some of the earliest mills were up Gazza's Creek and harvesting old growth redwood. So I was surprised by these coffins that were rather thin redwood boards that had been provided um, as people began to collect the dead from the beach and the cargo and bury many of these folks right there um, at an ad hoc cemetery out on the point. As we excavated downward, uh, despite the winds out there, we soon found that the coffins consisted of very eroded redwood. It had the texture of wet cardboard and not were very well preserved. The acidity of the redwood, of course, dissolves human bone where it sits, but otherwise the bones were in pretty good condition. We found aspects of other coffins that must have blown out in the past. In the days before the wire nails that we use, people use square nails, and these coffins had been hammered together with square nails and uh, metal strips. So those were evident. We began the barrel recoveries, um, very difficult to do as the sands were kept blowing back into the coffins. We found that the sailors had very, almost no artifacts at all. And because the historic accounts later informed us that these people would strip of their clothes because they knew in the sea, they were more likely to drown with their woolen clothes on. So they would enter the sea uh, without their clothes. So these uh, skeletons did not have much with them although we did find remnants of canvas sailcloth that they had been shrouded in. And one of the burials turned out to be particularly puzzling. If you look carefully, this individual at the feet was buried face down. Turned out from the pelvis, we could immediately identify that this was a woman, uh, which surprised us in this wreck uh, of the Franklin. At that time, we only knew of the Sir John Franklin wreck. And later, as I will uh, tell you about, we did forensic studies on other skeletal remains that we exhumed. And we did a, a process called laser ablation of teeth. Laser ablation is a, a means of identifying various uh, isotopic elements in human teeth that accrue during uh, your lifetimes where you live. Um, and we can actually identify what hemisphere people come from and frequently their locations of birth by um, the materials embedded in their teeth, by the chemistry of their teeth. This person turned out to be an African woman. Who was she? Who might she have been? There was no reference to her in any of these manifests. We don't know who she was, but it's very interesting to see that she was buried shoulder to shoulder with the sailors, but upside down, face down. Later um, in the 90s, other burials began to be exposed as erosion cut down the dune and creating a crater um, this is very unseemly for state parks to have the public hiking through skeletal remains. And so something had to be done. Um, in the late 1990s, Parks had recovered several other sets of human remains. And when I joined Parks in 2000, um, I began to also recover a couple of the skeletal remains that were now uh, exposed. So this is what it looks like out in the field. Coffins um, exposed by deflating sand dunes as the wind blows the sand away and the exposure processes that occurred. This is in the late 1990s uh, with state parks archeologists. These two individuals were buried with virtually no artifacts at all. Um, what we did find was an iron ring, probably a grommet from a sail. And we found a pocket knife with one of the sailors. Interestingly, the pocket knife had the blade out and was by the sailor's hand. And we suspect he was busy trying to cut something before he perished. You also have to understand that these people, when they're thrown in the sea, those who could swim um, are also amidst all the wreckage. There's a lot of wood flying around in those surf, in the surf. And many of the skeletal remains we found were uh, damaged by being impacted by a wooden beams smacking into them and also in, uh, as they washed up on the rocks. Um, and so it was a very traumatic uh, recovery process. And so we realized that the information was in the skeletal remains. And uh, by this time, we had collected eight sets uh, of the exposed ones and did not desire to expose any more. Rather, we prefer to leave them in peace. But we decided that it would also be important to do the forensic anthropology on these individuals to see what life at sea might have been like. And so we did that. 
And we found things that were not too surprising. In fact, we found that most of the individuals were quite healthy to our surprise. Um, we found that there were certain bones that had greater uh, calcium deposits or greater bone deposits on their arms and legs because of the labor involved at sea with ropes and pulling things and uh, living on a heaving deck. Um, <clears throat> When you look at life at sea, it's pretty precarious. You know, these ships are moving all over. They're not like luxury passenger liners at all. So you have to be uh, very balanced and stable. And uh, the work on board a ship is quite hard. And all too often, these ships had very short lives and ended up like this image. So when I got on board um, and we did the forensic anthropology, we also decided we had to stabilize the site and reinter the remains when the studies were done. Among the things we found in the forensic studies was that all of these individuals, all eight, including a couple who were passengers as well as sailors, um, we found that they were um, heavily laden with toxic levels of lead. And that uh, apparently is attributable to the fact that welding of, of metal cans had just been developed. And so ships stocked up on provisions of canned good provisions that were toxic from the lead soldering. And people were unaware that they were ingesting all that lead. So that was something we learned too. Um, in order to stabilize the site, we had to first map it. And so we developed a very detailed map uh, with the volunteer trails and the dotted line and the barrel recovery area located. Um, and then of course became the, the task, uh, the challenge of identifying what are the boundaries of the cemetery. Um, at this time, I had made acquaintance with members of the For Forensic Canine Institute based up in La Honda in San Mateo County, and they were expert at training um, dogs to find human remains at um, you know sites, at tragedy sites, as well as murder sites. The question was, could the dogs identify archaeological remains from the past? So we took them out to the point in Andy Nuevo, getting permit to bring the dogs into a dog uh, prohibited zone. And they began to tell us where the boundaries of the cemetery were. They could sniff out human remains, even archeological ones from the past. And they began to inform us of the um, dimensions of the cemetery so we could bound it. Um, in this picture, we're back again in the two, uh, many years later after we did the reburial and uh, did a training session. And I was amazed that the dogs were actually able to find the same spots where we had exhumed the burials many years before. So it was a, a treat to work with these forensic canine dogs. And this is the star, uh, Molly, who was uh, one of the earlier trained dogs. Um, and their company continues to pick out uh, human remains in fires where people have lost uh, their cremated remains in the houses in urns that they may have had on their mantle places. These dogs can find those urns in the ashes of burned houses. It's phenomenal. So I was very impressed and very confident. These dogs have GPS trackers on them so we can construct a map of where they've been. And uh, that proved very beneficial. The next stage was then to secure the site from further damage. So I hired a contractor um, to do that. A very challenging operation because Highway 1 is one mile away as the co flies and there is no easy route to this point. So the contractor had to go along the beach with his equipment from Gazza's Creek all the way up to Franklin Point and do the work. Um, after securing permission from our natural resource staff uh, because of the endangered plants and such, we were able to pick up a trail route and save many of the plants for later replanting. I also had to get a permit from the Coastal Commission to build a trail here. They were skeptical of it because it didn't have a destination and a beginning. And I reminded them that um, tongue in cheek, I said, well, it's not really a trail, it's a roof. We're building a roof over the archeological site. And they thought, yeah, okay. So they accepted that explanation and we were able to proceed. So by this time we had done the forensic studies on the skeletal remains and decided to reinter them um, at the point where they had come from. So these are scenes of the reinterment process. I'm here to tell you that your entire skeletal set will fit in a standard banker's box. And in this case, we had removed all the plastic and materials that many of the bones were kept in, transferred them to paper, put them in paper boxes, cardboard boxes, and began the reinterment process. The idea being that the boxes will degrade and disintegrate as will the paper bags. 
and leave the burials of dis as discrete individuals still. Then we covered it with some hardware cloth to keep the rodents from um, getting into it and T posted it down and then backfilled the site. So there are eight sets of skeletal remains that have been reinterred at the site. And then we had the challenge of course, constructing a boardwalk route to protect the cemetery and keep people, keep people, keep people on the appropriate trail. So that construction went along. Um, one of my many talents in archeology span was having to design a trail. They don't teach you that in school, you learn it on the fly. And so construction moved on from the burial deck and we created an observation deck as well on the point um, until winter storms came and swept away the beach, creating a new challenge. Um, and also vandals started chucking our timber into the sea too, which you know we're on a limited budget here. Um, but the contractor managed to contract a helicopter uh, from San Jose Airport who flew all the way over to Gazza's Creek and helped us achieve our goals through helicopter uh, delivery. This is where the Indiana Jones part of archaeology steps in, uh, you know, with helicopters and storms and, you know, burials on the coast and rugged weather. Um, I got to go for a uh, seat of my pants ride through an open side door of a helicopter. Um, that was cool. And as we floated over the uh, construction site, I get the message from the pilot and he says, uh, where shall we land? <laughs> and I really you know, didn't know what to tell him since he's the pro. And I looked down and said, well, I don't know. And uh, he decided he was gonna land on one of those small wooden decks. I couldn't believe it. Um, and he did. There were centimeters to spare on either side of that deck. And he landed that helicopter there and is the hero of the day because we were able to complete the process of the boardwalk, the deck, and stabilizing it um, with a few pretty hairy um, instances. It brings a whole new uh, understanding to a Star Trek expression of beaming aboard Scotty. And somebody's about to get a beam and a board in this scene, but it didn't fall. Um, we were able to complete the project, build the boardwalk, the deck, and create a place for the public to go. Uh, as they will anyways, um, and prevent some of the uh, erosion and destruction of this site. Um, one of the things I'm very proud of is that we were uh, in the reinterment process. I was able to get these individuals back to the point where they were buried. Um, I celebrated with a little tobacco and spilling a little whiskey out there. I figured that's what sailors might do. Um, and at the final touch, we built an observation bench, which is quite lovely because you see the ocean pass on both sides, a place to reflect on both the maritime history of the coast and the tragedies that can befall people at sea. That's the end of my talk, and um, I know it's kind of a rapid talk. Um, we did publish the results. State Parks does have an archaeological publication series. If you want access to that, I will send a link to the um, to the hosts, and they can forward that to you. These archaeological reports are free to the public in digital format. Um, Franklin Point is volume 35 and um, has all the details of the tragedies, the archaeology, and the eyewitness accounts, which are really quite stunning and moving. Um, so feel uh, free to look up online, California State Parks, Cultural Resources Division, publications and click on that and you will see a treasure trove of archaeological reports free to you, the public, who pays our salaries. So thank you very much. And thank you so much, Mark. Wow, what a very thorough presentation. And I, you know, we don't even have too, too many questions, but um, we have a couple that would love to, to ask you. And one of them is, you know, in talking with this, we've just got a couple more minutes. Um, can you hear me okay? I was giving yes. a lot of feedback that I'm a little quiet, so I'm going to talk as, as loud as I can. Yeah, um, I hear you. We heard you loud and clear, so that's good. <laughs> that's the important part. Um, you know, as you've, you're presenting about all of this in the history here, what are your concerns for the preservation of our cultural resources? Well, and preservation in place, of course. You know, people think that, you know, archaeology is about collecting artifacts and putting them in museums. Um, we've kind of shied away from that because we pre prefer to keep the archaeological sites in place. So preservation is key. Um, looting of archaeological sites can be a very serious problem. It's against the law, of course, on public lands. 
but that doesn't stop people from doing it. And so it's difficult to maintain the integrity of archaeology. Also, uh, much of what we do is not available to the public because of the need to protect resources. I'm going public with this site in particular because it's uh, not really possible to, for anybody to exhume anything. Uh, there are no real artifacts out here because of the nature of the wrecks and the way people uh, drown. So um, I feel good about publishing this for public benefit. So it's about preservation and also teaching you know, uh, about what we learn uh, to make it relevant to who we are today. Great, thank you. Um, and, and someone was asking, uh, Emiko was asking if you might be aware of what you might be aware of in terms of Ohlone people's accounts of the sailors from that perspective. And you're the person to ask him. About the Ohlone people and what? I didn't catch um, that. Their accounts of this. The, the, oh yeah, well yeah, by this account. time, by this time, the you know the Ohlone people have been dealing with the mission system 90 years since, um, and many of the native people are in what we call the dark age here, where their descendants are present, but we hear precious little about them. Um, we know that descendants of the Ohlone and some of the Coast Miwok people from Marin were hired as laborers later. By this time, the missions are gone. Uh, the Mexican period is over. It's the early American period uh, where the first laws of the California legislatures were laws of genocide. They legalized the murder of Native people um, and put bounty on them. There was payment for it. They legalized the slavery of children through the Indentured Servitude Act. Uh, these are the first laws that the California legislature passed. So there are no accounts from Native people on the coast at this time describing the wrecks. Uh, they weren't there to tell us about it, or if they were there, we're not engaged uh, with that. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then were you able to identify and contact any of the families of those people that were buried? I often get that question. And unfortunately, we, we weren't because we were unable to uh, do DNA at the time. It wasn't available uh, to us casually. Um, and we did not have a population base to compare it with. Mm -hmm. And there were no headstones identifying the individuals. In 1983, when we did the San Jose State excavations, we only knew of four burials. We didn't even know of the other two shipwrecks at that time. That had to be, uh, pardon the expression, unearthed um, through research later that followed suit. So um, we didn't actually know the scale you know, of all of that. However, having done several of these talks, I have gotten interesting accounts from people who say they are distantly related to some of these individuals. Um, and we are very grateful for the publication we did. Um, and we're aware that their relatives had perished here. So some of that has come through um, after doing talks like this, as members of the public have something to tell me about it. Oh, that's so interesting. So yeah, right. The, the further down of the uh, history buffs you get, they got to get it, they got to be interested in it enough to, to see if there's a connection. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, another question is, if the shipwrecks were at Franklin Point, why is the lighthouse at Pigeon Point? That's... Because Pigeon Point, where offshore at Pigeon Point, there is a reef, and that's where the ship struck. Okay. And the tide would carry them around uh, and spread the, the cargo out for miles, actually, along the coast. But Franklin Point became the recipient of many of the drownings, you know, the code between Pigeon Point and Franklin Point. There are other burials out there too, we have not located. There are many more uh, located along the uh, state parks property in the region that are covered under the dunes and may appear over time yet to come. We know uh, one of the mariners was buried by the Portuguese whaling village that preceded Pigeon Point Lighthouse. The Portuguese whalers from Pescadero would harvest and harpoon gray whales offshore and let the carcass drift around the point and then they would haul them into the cove of Pigeon Point and butcher them there. So there was a Portuguese whaling village. Um, some of the sailors saw the lights of the village and would work their way up the coast to seek uh, refuge there. Other wrecked sailors sought refuge at the White House Creek, um, the White House, White House Creek by Coast to Noah Lodge. Other sailors were given shelter at, uh, co at Coast uh, Coastways Ranch, at Cascade Ranch. Um, so um, Pigeon Point was built where it was because that was the prominent feature out there and was the first point of warning 
explore these ships. Mm -hmm. um, what is the long-term future for, for this specific site given coastal erosion there? Well, and that's a good question. I had hoped it would be longer than it's turning out. But as we know, coastal sea level rise is occurring rapidly and has taken out many of the Native American sites that I've worked on, particularly at Año Nuevo. I've been monitoring the loss of the sites there because of sea level rise. It is very manifest. And sites that I've known most of my life are now beaches and gone. Um, and that is true for, Pigeon Point, or for Franklin Point as well. The boardwalk is there. Some parts are tilting pretty precariously. I'm hoping that state parks maintenance will be able to get out there and um, save it. Um, but the important thing is that we got the burials back and that the deck above them is still intact. The rest of the route is eroding and it is a serious problem. And we knew from the day we buried them that someday the sea will reclaim the whole place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you have done such a wonderful job job of weaving story into this history. I think I'm, I'm reading all of these messages, people saying, this is the best, this is oh, thanks. a way. <laughs> I'm winging it. So thank you for that. Like I said, I'm not an entertainer. And oh, I, stum I stumble powerful. over my words. <laughs> so powerful. When you, I guess an, a, kind of another question, when we had talked about this before, but when you give these presentations, when you're educating this, you know, large number of people and and hopefully, you know, the growing level of interest, the people that start with the seed and really now they're hearing these stories and they, it kind of builds our interest level. Um, but what is your hope for what folks are doing with this information moving forward? Well, I hope they, they develop a sense of respect for the landscape we live on and understand there have been many people here before. My background is actually the archaeology of ancestral Native American culture. I've worked with tribal representatives all my life and have indeed, I've even hired native companies to do their own archeology span under you know, professional supervision. And I feel very strongly about that. And I decided to stop talking about native tradition in my profession because many native people today do not want non-native people, you know, creating a narrative about them. And so that's a transition that's occurring now as the native voice is finally being heard after a long time. And I should interject, the Ohlone people are still here. They form contemporary tribes, many of which are active right now. And I uh, work with them in, in deep respect. So I guess I would like people to recognize that people have been here since the ice age for many, many thousands of years. This, is, this never was a wilderness. It was a managed landscape. In some ways it has become a wilderness as the primary stewards are no longer managing it the way they once did. Um, so these are key takeaways as far as the maritime history to understand the ethics involved with archaeology, which sometimes supersedes science. Um, in this particular case, the decision was to reinter these remains and not keep them archived for future potential research. Now, in, in reburying them, we meet an ethical standard because archaeology is a weird science. It, it spans cultural needs as well as scientific ones. Mm -hmm. And in my world, I have to bow to the social aspects of it, and it makes me feel better. So reentering those individuals was the goal primarily. And I want people to understand that in the past, these are real living people. And as I alluded to earlier, reading the eyewitness accounts of survivors really hammers that home because archaeologically, we're dealing with the physical remains, the skeletal remains, and you wonder, what is the story of this individual? Who, who were they? You know, how tragic that they died right here, drowning in the surf, being battered by, you know, cargo and rocks and right, uh, right there on the shore that they've been striving to reach, you know, so close, they don't make it. There's even a retired school teacher coming back from a voyage um, back to Marin who dies, you know, after a long vacation. This African woman, who was she? What story might she tell us? Was she a servant? Or was she, you know, aristocratic in her own right? We have our own stereotypes about that. Are they true? You know, these are things that uh, people should ponder, you know, because ultimately we all go. Where will we end up? Will we become part of an archaeological landscape? Or, you know, what is our fate? So respect is a key part of this. And learning from the past, I'd like to say, so we don't repeat the mistakes in the future, but that doesn't seem to be the case. 
we seem to be prone to uh, repeat mistakes, I guess, um, from what I see. So I just hope people find enjoyment in learning about our past, our shared cultural heritage, which is for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for the gift of this time and sharing this with all of us. Um, and thank you to those of you who've stuck around, a huge number of you who've stuck around all the way through to the end here. We will, uh, <laughs> we will all have a lot to be thinking about as we move forward. And, um, and I love that, that lens of just the pondering of, of folks who are these people when we, we talk about that instead of that, the balance between the, the science, science side of that and then the, the cultural, but also human side of it too. Well, I have another pitch too. I've just been asked to join the board of the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And although you are a charitable institution that depends on donation, so does that museum. So I couldn't do this talk without saying that, you know. So if any of you are in the Santa Cruz region and uh, wish to make a visit to the little museum overlooking the Pacific Ocean, it's a wonderful place to go. We'll add that on the follow-up email too, just yeah. so people have that top of mind. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mark. And My thank pleasure. You. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And uh, just wait for, look for a follow-up email that'll be coming to your boxes in the next couple of days. So okay. share the message, share the, share the video, all of that. My pleasure. Have okay. a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.